Welcome to Linger Over Breakfast and all of our guests live streaming this morning. We are glad to have so many of you here. This is a wonderful example of together we are more and we are finally in person, sort of. Uh, I want to thank our founding sponsors for this event, St. Teresa's Academy and our virtual host today, Abilene University. Additionally, I want to give a big thank you to our new sponsors, the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation and the Buchanan Initiative for Peace and Nonviolence at Abilene University. Because of their generosity, today's event is complimentary. Today's event follows up on our sold out February 2020 event at St. Teresa's Academy, the Sisters of Selma, the March to Dismantle Racism Continues with Barbara Moore and Rosemary Flanagan, two of our sisters who marched in Selma in March 1965. Their experiences at Selma shaped their futures as well as their fellow sisters to be at the forefront of social justice issues. Now today, I'd like to introduce first, Sister Helen Flemington, our Kansas City Mission Advancement Advisor, who will lead us in a prayer. Sister Helen. Teach us to not be afraid, to trust in God's promise, Teach us to love courageously with hearts that are free and just. Teach us to protect one another and all that belongs to God. Teach us to dream a world where all are illumined by God's light. Teach us to keep the word of God and to proclaim it in our words and actions. Teach us to be gentle with our power and strong in our tenderness. Teach us to be for all children, living lessons of goodness and truth, a blessing of hope for all generations to come. I want to introduce our moderator, Carol Coburn, and I'm locking her, is a professor emerita of religious studies and director of the CSJ Heritage Center at Abilene University. She is also a consultant for the Buchanan Initiative for Peace and Nonviolence at Abilene University. Carol has published and presented extensively on the topic of American Catholic sisters, including a co-author book with Martha Smith, a CSJ, Spirited Living Lives, How Nuns Shaped Catholic Culture and American Life, 1836 to 1920. And so careful. Thank you, Sister Helen. Today on St. Joseph Worker Day, we're exploring racial discrimination as a part of our history and a part of what some call our original sin in the United States. It is the root cause of immigration issues as well as other isms. The Sisters of St. Joseph of Carondelet commit to addressing fully the violence of our time and the Sisters dismantling racial discrimination is one of their priorities. They advocate for change in our society and encourage us to work to examine our own personal biases. The sisters full statement can be found on their webpage. That's www.csjsl.org. I'll repeat that later on. So we'll come back to that. This morning, we're honored and delighted to have a panel of area civic, business, and religious leaders who will guide us on how we can join together in our continued march to dismantle racism. We're going to hone in today. We want to focus on Kansas City. We hear lots of discussions every day of our lives from news media and, and many people who are, thought, are thinking and reflecting on this. The four people we have with us today are, are very different from the other. In, in age, experiences, backgrounds, and that's great. That's fantastic.
for all of us. So we're choosing to share ideas and understandings. And let me introduce them to you, and then we'll, we'll go from there. On my far left, Kevin Wilmot, American film director and screenwriter, and a professor of film at the University of Kansas, and an Academy Award winner for Best Adapted Screenplay for the film Black Klansman. Next to him, my immediate left, Brianna Walker, Director of Equity Outreach and Inclusive Education Admissions Assistant at St. Teresa's Academy. She is the moderator of the Black Student Coalition and co-moderator of the Inclusion Project. On my far right, Sherman Weitz, Director in Education for the Kaufman Foundation. He is responsible for philanthropic investments for K through 12, and he also develops outreach strategies related to education. And my immediate right, Sheila Sonenshine, former at-large director and chair of the Greater Kansas City Interfaith Council. She is active with the national organization, Sisterhood of Salam Shalom. She is also a community activist, advocate, and freelance writer. So the way we're gonna do this is that we have given them some questions to sort of think and reflect um, on before they came but we wanna keep this informal and conversational. So I'll ask a question and sort of get out of the way and let each of them share thoughts and thinking, converse back and forth if they would like. And we'll, like I say, we'll keep this very, uh, very informal. So the first question we asked our panel to think about and reflect is this. Since change and progress have come so slowly on racial equality in 2021, what do you see as your top three priorities for immediate change, particularly on the national scene? Who would like to start? <laughs> that's, that's the way you do it in the classroom. <laughs> Get people going. <laughs> Dr. Carroll, we've already made a pact that I will never start. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've got dissension already. Here, so, so who's my volunteer? So I guess, I guess okay. in the pact, I was going first. <laughs> um, such a hard question because you want to kind of tackle everything, right? You wish. In my world, I shoot for the stars and land on a cloud, and so I want to tackle everything. But if I have to narrow it down to three, it's really just two in my brain. But the first thing, I think education and not... Um, the, not the institution of education in my eyes. I think um, a lot of times the institution of education, like schooling, formal education can perpetuate some of these injustices and inequities, um, but education around what is happening, education around our history, education around America's history, and then Missouri's history. I think that's really important. And then taking that education, the old adage, you know better, you do better, you gotta do better. So what happens next? Policy change. And I'm not just saying laws that need to change, but I think taking a deep dive and really learning about the structures that keep a lot of these things happening. And we can go on all day about what I believe the initial structure is, but I won't take up the stage. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would agree with you, Brianna. It, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a, a tough one because there's so much, right? Uh, and trying to narrow it down. I think right now, you know, the whole thing in the country happening right now with um, with policing, obviously. Uh, and and Kansas City has had its share of issues and problems, like all big cities do. Um, and there's good things and bad. But but I I love the fact right now that we are kind of looking at turning policing into a new idea. I think, I think that's really important at this moment. And, and I think, you know, what that turns into, hopefully will, it will expand the idea of policing, how we see policing. Um, I think that's a big problem. It's been, a, it's been a problem for a long time. I heard something the other day I thought was pretty good that, you know, with January 6th and all the crazy stuff that's happened here in the last couple of years, um, that they felt like there's like, like might be a race war going to happen. And 
somebody said, no, it's not that there's a race war getting to happen. We're trying to end the race war that never stops. And, and I think that's, that's really, from my point of view, more, more of what we've been trying to do. And I think this question of policing, I think it's a good example of, of cause that, that, so that's something that has really gone on since the notion of police. You know, that since the, since the idea of policing, that's been a problem in American life. And I, I think it's just now coming to the surface in the way that it, it should have been a long time ago, probably. And so hopefully we will, we'll take this moment and, and kind of, you know, look at it and, and rethink policing into something more community-based and something with less kind of violence at, and retaliation at the center of it, you know, which I think is, a, I think is the thing that everyone's talking about right now. That you know, you call for help, and and people end up getting killed, and and it happens every day, numerous times a day in this country, and that's and that's been a problem for a long time. Um, you, you know, you can talk about all the other aspects of of, of the problem of policing, but. But that, that one specifically, I think, is one that maybe can be addressed. And, and we could maybe see some, some movement at, with that at, at this moment. I was going to say that I also agree with um, the systemic racism that we need to, um, we all need to learn what that is and that it, it's, it's at every level of in our country and our being um, as a white person, a white Jewish person. Um, I really did not understand that fully until George Floyd was murdered. And it awakened in me um, like, oh my gosh, I, I have white privilege. I never knew, understood that until George Floyd. And as uh, President Biden says um, now, when he talked to um, Mr. Floyd's daughter, um, granddaughter, saying, um, my dad had changed the world. And he certainly changed mine. Um, and my experience is in the multi-faith um, community, working for almost two decades in this world, in the interfaith world. Um, and because of that and building relationships, and I think we'll probably talk about this as we go further, um, as we build relationships, we can tap into the relationships that we've built. So for example, when um, George Floyd was murdered and I had that awakening, I said, um, I have to do something. I have to do something even more. So I reached out to some of my friends. We reached out to each other and said, um, Let's start a book club. It's just the beginning, but let's do that. And the more I read and the more I talk to people, um, the more I'm learning and actually feeling like I've been so ignorant all these years. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. uh, and good morning to everyone. Uh, and, and thank you for allowing me to be a part of this. this I agree with all of the comments, and, and, uh, but I think the question was top three priorities. I couldn't get past number one in my head when I was thinking about that. And for me, it is how, how do we, or what can we do to humanize people of color? I think when you, when you make me human, a lot of other things fall into place. And I don't, in my opinion, we're not perceived as fully human in this country. Um, and, and, and there's case law and there's policy, there's actual laws in our history to support that. But I think in 2021, we're still battling that. I didn't think about it as ending a war. We're still battling this perception of we're not fully human, right? If we take care of that, then uh, all the other policy priorities around child welfare and housing and policing and education will begin to take care of themselves. Because you will become, you will begin to assess the problem and create solutions that represent humanity, 
And I think that's when we start to really see progress. Right now, we're addressing solutions in a band-aid manner. And in some cases, and, and I can speak for the job that I do, a very charitable man, savior complex. Instead of saying, wait a minute, we're all human beings. Why should human beings be homeless? Why should, you know, I'll bring it back to, to the thing that I do, which is education. Uh, in the Kansas City region, no matter what district, so people think urban when they, when they think about black people or they think, you know, Hispanic people, they, you know, we start putting people in geographic places, but if, in this entire region, black students do not perform at par with their white peers in reading and math. I mean, I'm talking about Lee Summit, I'm talking about Bruce Springs, I'm talking about Johnson County, the places where oftentimes people of color move to for better opportunities. We still don't perform in parity, right? And we know how to teach people how to read and how to do math. So why is it that I can still, I can move? And you think about it, that, that's a financial decision when you move to a place for safety or move to a place based on education. Why is it that I can invest dollars, move to a place and still not get parity in education? Right? And the data proves that out, regardless of where you are in the Kansas City region. So again, I, I just say, what, what is it? What are the thought exercises? What are the policy exercises? What are the tra trainings? Whatever it is, exposure that allows us to see everyone as human, and then we can start to solve problems on, on that level. If I may, yeah. Sure. Um, just responding to something. Um, especially in, re in regards to education and disparities in education, but then first and foremost, responding to um, something you said, but I'll start with education. I, I think we really have to look at generational trauma um, when it comes to that. Even, I mean, just looking at what you said, the statistics of students of color who are performing at lower, even at St. Teresa's, the black students at St. Teresa's aren't always performing at a level that all the other students are performing at. And I really do think that it has something to do with generational trauma and just the effects of that. I mean, you look at, if we take it from a human development standpoint, students or students that are in the classroom perform better if they were read to at the age of three and four in the home, right? Or if they had a library or at least three books in their household. Um, even if a black student or a Hispanic student had books in the household and were read to, I think it's still a generational trauma of knowing the vocabulary to use or the capital, the social capital that their parents may or may not have. And that plays a huge role in that. And so I just wanted to respond to that just because it's, it's something that I always think about just what is happening in the classrooms. We have students that go to St. Teresa's or go to uh, Blue Valley Northwest, which is also a, a very good high performing school, you know, and they're still not performing at the same levels. And I also want to point it to maybe bias that's happening what expectation, what, what level of expectation are we having for our students of color in the classroom? They're here, they're learning, but let me give them an, a little bit of extra help to get by. And I think that bias in the classroom, it kind of creeps in there, really does play a big role. So thank you for that sense because that got me thinking. <laughs> thank you so much. So let's take it down even further. Um, how how can we as individuals and or our organizations work toward personal, professional, and or community goals to move toward racial equality? You know, well, one thing, you know, that I love what Sherman said about, <clears throat> um, you know, about how when people don't see you as fully human, uh, there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. You know, that, I mean, it goes back to the education thing that Brianna and, you know, she was saying that um, we've never really fully educated ourselves in an honest way about how we live as Americans. I mean, you know, it's like, uh, you know, I'm, I make films and, um, and I make a lot of movies about history and people will come up and they say, I just learned about the fact that they they blew up 
Tulsa in, you know, and they blew up the black community in Tulsa. And, and it's like, yeah, I've been trying to make that movie for, for 25 years, <laughs> you know? And, and they just discovered it because it was on a show, you know, that had a segment about it. And, but we should be hearing about those things in school. And we should be taught those things in school. We should be taught about how people, the struggles that all of us, not just black folks, all of us have in, in, in trying to be full Americans. And, and, and because we don't really do them, um, we don't see each other that way. I mean, that's a big part of it. I mean, we, it's, hard, it's hard to, you know, kind of, you know, understand your pain if I don't know how your pain even happened to you. And, and so that, I think that's a, that's a big problem in terms of, you know, we've got to somehow, you know, you know, do all the other educational things that we need to do, but then also teach our, everyone about this unspoken history, this unspoken kind of American experience and really kind of world experience, but specifically American experience that defines our now. I mean, this is this is the thing, you know, you know, it's, I made a movie a few years back about black folks being so desperate in 1939 that they build a rocket ship and go to Mars. And and the reason and then they but they end up going through a time warp and, and they end up here with a black president. And the thing about that is that there are kids now that the only president they know is like Obama and, told, and, and Trump. So, and so hate, hate groups are now being able to speak to them because they don't know anything after Obama. All they know, they think having a black president is normal. Is like, that's just, Way it's that's every day. That's just so they don't know about the sisters marching in Selma. They don't know about how we the sacrifices and the struggles that it took to get to this point that you could have an Obama, you know. And 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 so we, I think it's easy to forget that 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 the perception that and I know on, on college campuses right now, hate groups are really speaking to those kids because they don't know this other, they, they think that they don't understand white privilege. They think people talking about white privilege is offensive and to them, and it's an affront to them and they feel attacked and they feel centered, you know, kind of, you know, targeted in that sense. So it's, it's a, you know, these things keep getting more and more complicated and, and it makes it harder to take it to the next level. You know, it makes it harder to, because it's like we've got to acknowledge this thing that we're not acknowledged. I, um, what you said, Kevin, all that you just said, um, I relate to in the sense of um, my, um, my work with the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom, which is um, a group, it's in the national group where Muslim and Jewish women get together once a month to build friendships and trust because people think Muslims and Jews can't get along. So um, we, we do social action. We meet, we meet each other and our families. And we also have taken trips. And one of the trips that I chaired was a trip to the American South, a civil rights trip. And uh, the executive director of the sisterhood would say, you don't know until you're actually there and you can feel it. And that is exactly what happened because um, growing up, okay, we learned about Martin Luther King Jr., but really just at the circus. And it wasn't until we were actually on the ground that I felt it a little more viscerally. Of course, though, not as deep as it needed to be even. I mean, there's so much depth that I need to learn. I need to learn more about. Um, well, one of the places we went to on the civil rights trip was the lynching memorial. It had, we were there on opening day um, with the Equal Justice Initiative. And I knew about lynchings, but 
I really didn't know about the machines, really. What that meant, you know, just taking someone off the street and hanging them. And what I learned there too is we are having modern day lynches. Um, when, when there is a black person who's driving and the police comes and it's just, uh, you know, they say it's a traffic violation and then they end up being killed. That's a lynching. Um, what happened to George Floyd is a lynching, I mean, right on his neck. Um, anyway, we have these modern day lynchings and I think as we learn more and see it more viscerally, um, and we have to keep teaching the next generation. My hope is that the generation, the next generation after me is better educated and understands it better um, so that everyone can be on the same level, that, that black people or brown people are not at the very bottom, um, as Isabel Wilkerson says in her book, Cast, that Black people are on the very bottom. And um, I, it's very, it is very upsetting to me. And so I do hope that as we go along, people will understand more and that we do have to look at people um, as individuals, as human beings, um, and that everyone would have the right to everything that anybody has the right to. Sheila, I'd like, yeah. to, I'd like to build on what you and Kevin have said. Mm -hmm. uh, you just triggered a whole lot of thoughts. Mm -hmm. and, uh, grow, I remember growing up learning about and being excited about learning about the Irish and how they were treated. You know, there's a point in our American history where the Irish weren't white, right? They were Irish. Right. There's a point in our world history where Jewish people weren't white. You were Jewish, right? Now we were there. Now it's 2021, like we, we always find ways to other a group, even when they may look like you identified yourself as white, but you were still othered, right? And there are parts in this history. And, and what Kevin's comment made me think about is the fact that I learned about uh, various points in our world history in school, and it made me empathize with that group of people. So to think about not learning about Tulsa, right? I grew up um, where the Moore family uh, in Mims, Florida, I grew up in, in central Florida and right within an hour of where I grew up, uh, there was a Christmas morning bombing of the NAACP leader. I never learned about that in school. Right. My grandfather took us through Mims and talked about it, right? But why didn't I learn about something that happened so close to me? And it's the same with people, I used to live in Arkansas, people didn't know about the Tulsa race riots. It's within an hour of where you live and you've never learned about it. Meanwhile, I learned about what happened in Germany. I learned about what happened in New York with various ethnic groups and it made me empathize with them. So I'm trying to figure out why isn't, we don't have the space in the curriculum to learn about black people and to learn about Latinx people. Cause I, I, I didn't, learn about Cesar Chavez in, in K-12 schools. We, we make space for some and not others. Yeah. And, and, and I'm thinking about how it actually helped me to humanize other groups. Again, going back to that, why, why is this intentional? And if not, then what do we do? Because we don't need to keep talking about it. 10 years from now, we don't need to have the panel talking about the very same thing. We should be talking about new problems, not the old problems. Yeah, I was going to say it. I mean, it doesn't get taught in schools because someone has to be blamed for it. Then, if you teach about the Holocaust, you don't have to blame anyone in America for that. If you teach about apartheid, you don't have to blame anyone in America for that. You teach about civil rights, you teach about Selma, you teach about bombings in Mims, Florida, you have to blame somebody in America. And nobody wants a mirror placed in front of them at all, you know, nobody. I don't want a mere place in front of me, especially as I even grapple with my own biases about the world that I live in. Nobody wants that, nobody does. And I think that's a, a big part of that. And then when we talk about, um, yeah, 
yeah, just when we talk about education, definitely. Yeah, and going up what you said, Brianna, I think I think you nailed it because you know that just stops us, mm -hmm. and 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 we just don't move forward, and and you know, but we live in this multiracial democracy. I mean, January sixth told us all that that we live in a multiracial democracy, mm -hmm. and that's what it looks like when people don't like that, and. And the reason that a lot of those people were storming the Capitol is because of what we're talking about right now, because they don't have empathy for others. They don't know the pain of others. They don't, you know, you've got someone out there with um, basically like Nazi paraphernalia on and, uh, and how, do you, how do you get, you know, he's an American kid that grows up like all of us did. How do you get from there to there, right? How do you get there? And it's because somebody taught him, didn't teach him the stuff we're talking about. Somebody, somebody did not break through to him on some level, because my experience with kids, and you guys are, know about it better than I do, but my experience with kids, the kids want to know the, the real deal. I mean, they, they, they get bored with school because they don't hear what they really want to hear. And when you tell them, you tell them the, the real, you know, the real story, the, the put the mirror up to folks, make them a little uncomfortable. I mean, being an American to me means you've got to be uncomfortable. That's what a multiracial democracy means. You gotta, you gotta be willing to live in discomfort. <laughs> you know, and, 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 and we don't do that. I mean, the minute the mirror shows up, then that's, it's all over. With. I, I didn't even think about that, what you just said, Marie, about, about the mirror and, well, we don't have to look at ourselves. That I, I really appreciate hearing that. Um, I, I also want to say about with youth. There is an organization called the Interfaith Youth Corps that is in Chicago, and Ibu Patel is the founder. And the premise is that if you get, if you um, catch youth, you know, when, when they're looking for a group to belong to, um, if you catch them and say, you know what, let's get together, people of all these different faiths and cultures, and let's do community service together. Um, let's go paint a house together. Let's tend to a garden that helps um, grow food for food pantries. Then you, you get to know each other like in a non-threatening um, way. Um, you get to know each other as, from human to human. And you're, you're taking the youth and keeping them away from the influences of what supremacy. Um, so that they don't fall into that group. Um, so I think we do need to catch people when they're young and do something productive um, with them so that they, they, don't, they don't get into extremist groups and do what the people did on January 6th. And then also teaching the trials and the triumphs of people of color in this country, and not just people of color, but everybody in this country needs to learn the trials and the triumphs. Um, I think specifically about um, different programs that take people in the bus loads across the truce divide. And in theory, awesome, get people to learn about this street, minuscule thing in Kansas City that divides everybody. But then on the other side of that, it's kind of exploitive, right? You don't go east of truce just to look at the abandoned homes and see the guys on the corner, or you don't go over there just to see that. But if maybe you go to the Sunfresh on Blue Parkway, maybe then you can start to humanize people. You, it still dehumanizes people to get on a bus and go and learn about the truce divide. It, it humanizes people to go to the Sunfresh or to go to Leon's grocery store that's now closed, unfortunately. That was the, the, the first and longest running black owned grocery store and just closed this year, you know, on the east side. And that's when we talk about humanizing people. And I think the book club is amazing. That is the start, that's the groundbreaking part of it. But it also kind of keeps you away 
from that group, when you read about them, it seems, it seems very distant to read about the trials of people, but when you can put yourself in the triumphs of people, going to church with them, going to their grocery stores, going to the Boys and Girls Club on 43rd in Cleveland, it really does help. And I talk about that a lot when talking with larger groups, because that's the question I get, well, what do I do? Well, what am I supposed to do? Well, it's at your fingertips. You may live 20 miles away or 20 minutes away, but there's definitely a theater on Maine. You know, there's different things that you can do. And so I always talk about that. Um, but and I just wanted to respond to just that point of being humanized that um, Sherman, you brought up. I love what you're saying. And in some cases, you live zero minutes away from history, the city. I sit in a home every day that was built with a racial covenant, right? Section five, you can't, cannot sell or rent to Negroes. Here I am a Negro sitting in this house, right? With a, with a 10 year old in the next room. What can I tell her about segregation? When she asked me, well, why does our neighborhood have no, no kids that look like me? Right? There's a reason for that. 50, 60, 70 years ago, there was some policy in place that uh, promoted practices that are still lingering in 2021 that a 10 year old can notice. And she's asking a question and she's not necessarily getting the answers from her school environment, but we're zero minutes away from history. The house we live in, we couldn't live in at one point in our lives. And now we live in that house, right? So we don't even have to go across truths to talk about the history of the city. How do we build common ground or community? We talk, we use those words all the time. Well, we have to search for common ground. We have to work as a community. But specifically in Kansas City, again, we'll keep the, we want to keep the focus there. Um, how do we go about building common ground or community to facilitate meaningful change across the city? We actually, you've done such a good job in terms of your thought processes so far that, that we've even uh, addressed this. But, but any other comments, particularly on, on pulling people together uh, from any of you, even though some of you have very uh, wonderfully shared ideas so far. I'll just let that sit. And if, if everything's been said, we'll go on to another one. But but what is common ground? What does that mean? Besides, it's good. It's good words. Well, you know, one thing I think, um, when you look at like Selma, and you look at, um, you know, past, the, the past, and uh, where in the past, common ground kind of brought people together, for a common goal to take something on, um, and and it was that it was that goal of overcoming something that kind of created the common ground that brought different kind of folks together. Um, you would have thought the pandemic would have brought us together. You you know you would have thought that you know that all of us in this situation where this virus can can kill us and we have to work together to save ourselves to save each other and the fact that 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 was even you know used against common ground so we we've kind of got to figure out uh how to talk to these folks who don't want to wear a mask we got to find a way to talk to these people who um don't want to take the shot don't want to get the vaccine uh, and to me, that's like become the metaphor for everything we're talking about. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's, it's not really about the shot or the, or the mask. It's about a whole bunch of other stuff. <laughs> it's about the history thing and all the stuff we've been talking about. And so if we can, you know, when you look at Dr. King and you look at the civil rights movement and you look at the other movements that have happened and really the movement that's going on right now, um, you know, there's a lot of common ground and it's so great to see Jewish, black, white, Asian, Latino people out there in the street demanding this stuff to change and end. It is so, so, so great. That's common ground that everybody's come together to kind of take this thing on that they, they understand needs to change. Um, and now they're creating laws to 
to, you know, you can run over a protester and not get in trouble. And, I mean, oh, that's a, that's they're, 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 they're trying to do that right now. And it's crazy. But it lets you know that there are forces in the country that don't want us to have and and there's forces in the country that don't want us to, you know, all get together and, and in the virus, you know, or be safe from the virus. So, you know, we've got to find a way to talk to those folks. And then one of the things I've been saying to, here lately is that it's those people who don't have maybe my best interest in mind as a black man, that's not my job to change their mind it's the folks that look like them have to change their mind about how they feel about me. And, and, I, and I don't say, I'm not saying that as a cop out, but I'm saying that folks in the room with those people, folks that they know have to talk to them. It's not about me, the outsider coming in, lecturing you know, about how, how wrong you are about something. It's about people in, within their circle so when people say wrong things, they say the bad thing, you gotta call them on it, right? The, 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 the mom, the dad, the friend, the neighbor, the classmate, the, 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 the working colleague, they gotta, you gotta say, hey man, that's, and it's not about political correctness, it's about all of us being able to live as fair, you know, human beings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then taking, you know, just that getting in the room with people, even those rooms that are homogenous, say a church or a, a Catholic school, for instance, I mean, you get into those spaces, but then you have to try to bridge the two ideals together. So how does Christianity and social justice fuse together? And I think what we're doing at STA is saying they fuse together because it's about humans. It's not about being Christian. It's not about social justice or politics or whatever it is. It's about being human and right is right and wrong is wrong, right? And so I think if we can, in those pockets of places that are very homogenous saying, okay, how does our homogeneity fuse together with this ideal that we wanna stand behind, we just don't know how. And I think it's because the, 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 there's a disconnect between how those two things can really connect to each other and how they really don't have to connect. They are actually one, in itself. And I think that's a, a big issue when we talk about being in spaces and having spaces where if you're going to a white space, you as a white person have to educate those white people. You have to not only educate them about what's happening, you have to educate them about why our ideals really fuse with the ideals that I'm trying to teach you about. And that's where I think it has to start when we talk about common ground, um, that discussion has to be had of how do these things align with my morals and my values as a human. Um, what you were saying, both of you were saying um, about white people, let's say, um, needing to call people out, educate, say, no, that's not okay to say, um, do you know why, and, you know, all those things. Um, and that, the reason for the book club was so that I would do the work, that I need to do the work first before I might even know what is offensive or what is, you know. Sure. Would, that would hurt somebody, someone. Um, one, um, one aspect of the multi-faith, multicultural world is going into a, other people's spaces. Um, so instead of um, bringing someone in, let's say who's Asian American, into maybe an interfaith council meeting, Instead, let's go, let's go meet people in the Asian community and get to know them. Is there a church? Is there or some place of worship um, where they go? Or like you're saying, the grocery store? Or, um, and really building relationships. I think that's what we really need to do, um, is build the relationships, hear each other's stories, um, which is the premise of the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom. If we hear each other's stories, um, and build the relationships, then we really can't hate each other because we, we are knowing each other on a human level, um, while at the same time still appreciating the differences. That we are, we are human, but we also have, there are different aspects of our lives. 
might be Jewish is different than someone um, maybe whose faith is Catholic. And maybe the way, I, I think in the end, we see it the same way. We, there's one God, we, um, we all wanna do the right thing, the moral, the moral thing, but I practice Judaism in a different way than someone who's Catholic practices Catholicism. So being out in the community, reaching out, educating ourselves, and, um, and also appreciating the differences. I'd like to give three quick examples of, of how my organization, the Kaufman Foundation, uh, addresses the question. And it kind of underscores why I love this work. Uh, the first one was, you mentioned something about uh, Equal Justice Initiative down in Montgomery. One of our grantees, uh, the Urban League of, of Greater Kansas City, uh, before the pandemic was taking cohorts of people uh, to Alabama to see the lynching museum. I know that's not the formal name of it, right. as well as a bus to Selma. So that's the only time I've ever been to Selma. Um, I moved to Kansas City so I can go to back to the South where I'm from uh, and learn about these things. Uh, so, but but I know uh, the Urban League and, and Gwen Grant, they, they've taken cohorts of people down there, uh, professionals, civic leaders, uh, legislators, what, whomever, to sit around. And part of that part of that trip is we sit around the table and we discuss what we've seen, right? Uh, so when you come back to Kansas City, it, you have a different lens around uh, uh, race and equity. That's one example. Another example is uh, we've been piloting some what we call equity in schools cohort. So we were taking uh, district leaders and charter school leaders from around the Kansas City region. Uh, again, a cohort model. That's a theme with my work. I like to get people in a group together and talk, talk through things. Um, we, uh, they, they start out with an equity audit of their district and or school. And then they go through a series of uh, trainings and meetings and activities. And they end up, say, nine months later with an equity plan to implement. So putting all of this, this conversation into action. And then the last one is something that we actually launch next week, which is, uh, uh, we call it Ready KC. Uh, Ready stands for Race, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. So Ready KC Community of Practice, it's going to be a cross-sectional cohort of organizations in the region. Boys and Girls Club, Lead Bank, um, uh, the Civic Council, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, Nelson Atkins Museum, variety, probably 15 organizations along with Kaufman because so many of the people we invest in or, or invest in uh, organizations to support are, are people of color. And in order to do that work well, we have to evolve internally. We have to put the mirror up to ourselves and say, and assess how we're doing our work. And we've probably been on this racial equity journey in a formal way for probably three, four years. And now we're asking a cohort of people, again, this is the model that I am using personally, to, to come together, let's take this journey together. Because as we invest in organizations and their capacity, in order for our uh, strategic plan to be successful, everyone else has to come along with us. So it's a little bit of the blind leading the blind because we're far from expert, but we're putting that mirror up and saying, what is it we can do together to come along? We've got some national experts coming in to kind of teach us and lead us. Uh, I call them Sherpas uh, as, we, as we go along this journey. But you know, if I can be as audacious as to convene groups knowing that I'm not the expert on something, let's walk this journey together so that when we get to where we want to be one, three, five years from now, uh, we can start setting aspirational goals of what we want the region to look like and be like and feel like and what those hiring practices are and how do we create a prepared workforce? Um, how do we, we're an entrepreneurship foundation. So, so what does it look like around economic mobility? So instead of measuring success by standardized test scores or quality seats, how do we start to look at macro indicators? What does a medium income look like of, of people of color? Uh, how inclusive is our economy? What's the economic mobility opportunities? And, and what are the barriers? How do we begin to knock those down? So having these key partners at the table with us in this now virtual community of practice that we're about to launch is going to be key 
to the success of the region, in my opinion. So thank you for allowing me to share. We're closing in on 10 o'clock, and um, this has been an incredibly rich, rich um, conversation. Um, and what I, I think Barb is going to check to see if there are questions or either have they've come in on the chat board or here. But if I could get each of you to maybe just take a, a, a sentence or two and sort of what points would you like to make that we've not talked about? Give me one or two sentences. And I say that because of time. I would love to talk with you more because this has been one of the, the very rich conversation for me as well. But if I get each, each of you, if I could get just a couple of, of comments in terms of what do you want to say that I haven't asked you or given you an opportunity to that, that you want to put into this discussion as we as we wind down? And we can go a little longer if it's okay with our panelists. We'd love to keep you here all day. <laughs> <laughs> you have well, I would say um, in Judaism, in the Bible, it says, um, set it, set it to go. Justice, justice shall you pursue. And in the Torah, um, every word counts. So why would there be two, tzedek, tzedek, justice, justice? And one, I, um, one thought is there's the tzedek for the individual. As an individual, I need to pursue justice um, and, do, and do what's right. The second tzedek is the community. As a community, we need to have justice and work together for justice. I'll, I'll, I'll go next. I, I spent the majority of this morning trying to tie this tie. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have 50 ties. I know how to tie a tie, at least I did. And in the past year, I haven't tied a tie. <laughs> so when I went to put it on, I literally had, I tried it about 10 times and then I went to YouTube. And, and the point I'm making is, even if you think you have a skill, if you don't use it, it atrophies. You have to actively think about what you're doing and why you're doing it and how many times you're doing it. I had tied a tie in 18 months and I literally forgot how to do something that I learned when I was a child. And the analogy is the obvious. racial equity. Okay, it can be a conversation or it could be action. Because if you don't have the action, then you're gonna you're not you're gonna forget that muscle memory. Right? I literally had to watch a video to do something that I that I know how to do. That that's that's what I want. You know, uh, you know, going off what you said, Sheila, that. Uh, I love what you just said for sure, but that's really good. <laughs> uh, what you said, oh, Sheila, about, um, you know, about how in the book club, you know, you kind of had to read it to kind of feel the confidence to kind of share and, and to be able to, you know, be in discussion and conversation about these kind of things. I think that's really important. Um, but, you know, we, we gotta, we've got to make sure that we don't allow um, you know, the, the world to make us feel like we don't have authority, you know? And uh, we're all Americans, we're all human beings. Uh, we all have a stake in this. And, you know, we have to be willing to not allow all the pressures that, that are surround us every day that tell us shut up and sit down to not allow us to shut us out, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and I think when it comes to race in particular, uh, people feel like they, they don't have the authority to even speak. And, uh, and, and, and people need to, you know, be willing to, to step out even if they're wrong because what happens is that I, I kind of believe that the man that murdered George Floyd, the policeman that murdered George Floyd, that when he had his knee on his neck, he was thinking about all the other black people he wanted to kill. 
all the other black people that he's encountered as a policeman that he's had anger and frustration with. And it's, it wasn't that just that moment. I don't think. That's just my own little theory about it. And, and it maybe he had talked about how he felt about black people and about policing and about his job in the world that he lived in every day, encountering people with a lot of difficulties every day. Maybe he wouldn't have, maybe he wouldn't have took it out of George Floyd, you know? And, and so in that, in that sense, I think we're all George Floyd. The knees, the knees been on all of our necks and we gotta find a way for people to to be able to express themselves so that they didn't kill us. Since I have to say something, no, I'm just kidding. Um, the, the quote that stays with me every single day, um, it says, we're not a product of our environments. Instead, we're a product of our expectations. And there's a lot of people that disagree with that quote. Um, and I think it's because we're only thinking about the individual. You are a product of your expectations. And I, I don't look at it that way. I look at it that way, but then I also take it a step further and say, I'm a product of my expectation of you. It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy, so you will. So if I, if I don't expect anything more from you, your situation, your environment, then I can continue living my life knowing that my expectation of you is confirmed. And I think if we can get to that, if we can get to what are our expectations of the world around us, of the people around us, we can really start to dive into some really heavy hitting, thought provoking, world changing work. If I expect more from people who live on 39th and Vineyard, then maybe I can use my resources my own expectations and come over there and help and give back and give in and pour in. And so that's what I want to leave everyone with. Yes, we have a question from the audience. Okay. I have two questions and I'll you know, decide which way you want to go with it. Um, Kevin, back to your um, I teach high school and you talked about making kids uncomfortable. You know, that's our job to make them uncomfortable. I make my students uncomfortable. They go home and tell their parents that they're uncomfortable, and then the school gets phone calls. But not my other child or father child is uncomfortable. Why would bring calls to them to? And then two, one of the things about going into other spaces, how do I do that without feeling like a point or without? And why would I assume that people in other spaces would trust that I'm there for them? To build a bridge, not just to be I'm here. You know, I don't. So I, I've always kind of struggled with that. So yeah, I'll just say real quickly. Uh, that thing you said about how, you know, when, you know, and I know my movie CSA, you know, they, it's been shown and people show that movie in classes. And then um, this was a, this was a, one day, I'll just tell you the whole story real quick. <laughs> one day, one morning, I get a call from New York Times and then they said, did you hear that uh, this big fancy school in New York City, big liberal hip New York City, what showed your film and and uh, and there was this huge uproar about it, and the principal had to apologize to the entire school for showing your film. And my film is only about it's about what happens if the South had won the Civil War, and uh, it has no cussing, it has no sex, it only has American history, in it. and. Uh, and that's the problem. That's the problem that that I think institutions, the educational institution, the, the whole idea of how we're going to educate people. We have to decide, you know, what values we believe in and what values we don't believe in. And uh, and unfortunately, you know, you can't get real. But the Klan's guy over here and the Nazi guy over here, they're looking for the kid that doesn't know what's up. 
you know, in, 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 in at KU and around the country, that you'll see posters around campus. Are you, aren't you tired of feeling guilty about being white? And those are proud boys. That's how they recruit in those spaces. And so they get unsuspecting kind of people who don't know what's up and they take advantage of them and because they don't know and because you can't teach because you can't have a discussion in class about the real deal and uh and that's a that's a big problem that's a big problem and 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 we better figure that one out because these guys are taking advantage of the fact that you can't have that discussion and really can't teach the the tough I, I always call it the other, the other end of American history. You can't teach the other end of American history. And because you can't teach that, then, then the Klan teaches it to them. And the Nazis teach it to them. And, and that's how you get January 6th. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, so, um, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dave. In 2006, um, a student came into my office and told me about this Facebook thing. He said, you need to get on Facebook because that's where all the students, that's how you communicate. I thought it was a great thing. Let's do it. I started communicating with students. About eight years later, I noticed that people say crazy things on Facebook. And I'm like, well, this is easy. You just talk to your wrong. You read this, read this, read this. Oh, no, they You can call names on it. Well, what's this all about? Willful ignorance, willful ignorance. How do we how do we deal with willful ignorance? And it's kind of what you're saying, Jeff. It's like, man, it, what do you do? It's so frustrating. Um, so I sure. Um, Dave was asking basically, he talked about his experiences of going on Facebook <laughs> that deteriorated over time and this idea. <laughs> He said, how do we deal with willful ignorance? Those people, students who, who just, no, I, no, not, not gonna believe that, that they just choose not to educate themselves or choose to open their minds. How do we, how do we deal with that? Is that, uh, Dave, is that good? So that's, that's what was asked. I think the awesome thing about social media is that other people see it too. So they're responding to you in a comment, but they're also responding to everyone else who is reading that post and maybe thinking the same way as you or maybe thinking the same way as them. And I think the awesome thing about um, about that space is that you can say what you want to say. You can only plant the seed. You know, I think that's what this whole idea of education is. We got to plant the seed. You can plant the seed. And if that person doesn't take heed to any of that, guess what? Two other people may take heed to what you said. And that's why you respond to people. That's why you call people out. That's why you continue to educate people about what's right and what's wrong. Because you may not change the the the, K, the Klan man, or you may not change the Nazi. You may not change anyone. But you can definitely educate the person that's on that, on that post and not commenting. Or maybe saying, hmm, I'm kind of in between on all of this. That's, that's who you're responding to. You're responding to the person that wants to learn more and wants to hear your thoughts about it. I, I agree wholeheartedly. I'd like to add that uh, our tendency is to other folks when, we, when they believe something that we feel is, is uh, irrational or, or nonsensical. Uh, and, but there's willful ignorance at the Kaufman Foundation. There's willful ignorance at St. Teresa's at Avila, like rather than spend time othering them, I want to, again, put that mirror up and examine myself, uh, my leaders, my, my institutions, practices and policies and saying, what is it we have willful ignorance around, right? Um, I'll stop there. Why don't we finish? Sheila wanted to address something about your, your first question. And so we'll finish with, with that on the Q&A and then we have a few announcements. So actually, I'm sorry, we do have one question from um, somebody online if we could address that. Okay, let, let Sheila yep. respond and then we'll, we'll, that'll be our final question. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. So um, you were asking about, well, how do I go into another space? Um, without being a lawyer. 
um, I, I try to seek out places where I can go. For example, what happened with the murder of George Floyd, I immediately called Foursquare and said, because I knew that they did um, um, equity and equality uh, initiatives all around Kansas City and on the um, Kansas side as well, Wyandotte County. Um, so I pursued that knowing that if you don't know an organization, let's say, um, I would just probably Google and just try to find places or if you know people who are in that realm, ask them. Something came across an email from KU Med Center and they have all sorts of classes um, on, um, you know, uh, book clubs and just getting information about learning about other, learning about others, um, someone who's not like yourself. I also want to say there's an organization called JCRB AJC, which is here in Kansas City, the Jewish Community Relations Bureau, American Jewish Committee. And the mission is to do outreach and to um, bring the community together. So everyone does learn from each other. Well, I want to understand more about anti-Semitism. You can go to the JCRB AJC or um, we had a um, unity seder just before Passover. And that would be a great way to then meet people who are not like ourselves. This year it had to be virtual and we broke up into small, um, into breakout rooms at different points as if we had like a little table. And, um, and then we got to meet each other. People, um, I met someone who was evangelical Christian and I met a um, black man. And it was so wonderful. So um, you can go to places, places like that. And I'm also happy to um, advise or give give suggestions. Why don't you share the last question, or or I'll yes. repeat it if, if need be. Yes. So, um, Rihanna or Sherman, do you know of any examples of schools or school districts in our region that have made meaningful change in their curriculum? to educate students about the truth of racial injustice throughout American history and or the history of our city in particular? Well, not to toot, or, <laughs> but St. Teresa's Academy <laughs> is really making some strides, um, very much so. And, and obviously I understand um, the barriers to attending a school like St. Teresa's Academy, um, such as finances and tuition. Um, the St. Teresa Academy is doing awesome things. And unfortunately, I don't know of any other schools outside of that. I do know that Shawnee Mission School District um, just hired last year their inaugural position for Director of Diversity and Inclusion. Um, uh, Dr. Tyrone Bates is the Director of Diversity and Inclusion for Shawnee Mission School District. And he does wonders, wonderful things, starting conversations. Um, and that started from a parent group. Um, I'm trying to think if I know of anything else. Um, and then obviously, um, Lee Summit School Districts, um, while there's still a lot of things that they need to work on, I think just with last year, um, implementing diversity and inclusion training for, for district-wide, for all of their faculty and staff, I think that was an amazing um, step forward for them. Um, so those are really the tangible examples that I have. I, I know you, you asked, a, the, the person online asked a curriculum specific question. So I, I, I don't have a specific answer to that, but in terms of pe uh, districts and charter schools uh, making strides, uh, oh, I can give you a, a whole bunch of examples. Everyone from Shawnee Mission to Lee Summit to, to Liberty to DeSoto, Kansas, like people, this is, this is top of mind for people. I'm thinking about early childhood uh, and, and United Inner City Services. I'm thinking about in the northeast part of the city, uh, Scola, Villa Nueva. Uh, they're, they're, this, this Brookside Charter School, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, organizations and institutions where this is top of mind and they're trying to figure out how to integrate this into teacher professional development and curriculum. I don't know curriculum specific examples, but I could probably name, I didn't even name Kansas City Public Schools, which is, uh, uh, we work with the Center for Conflict Resolution, and uh, they train all uh, several schools 
within KCPS around restorative justice practices, right? How do we change our, when we do go back in person, how do we change our, our, our discipline numbers uh, and uh, expulsion and suspension? So that, there, there are numerous examples uh, around where people are thinking about policy and practice. I don't have specific examples around curriculum, however. And so just one more thing I would like to throw out. Um, we've got to be advocates for our for our children. Um, so if that person has children and they're looking for schools to send their child to, which they probably are, um, join the, the parent teacher association, join, join the board of parents, whatever structure there is at that school that you're looking at, join that group of parents go if you are interested in kcps go to the school board meetings they are public um you can go to them you can watch them online also hear what they're doing and then also give suggestions we all know education as a whole um lacks in how much they pay teachers or we pay teachers um, and so if you are able to volunteer your time your services your skills your knowledge um, around these things volunteer to do some after school work with the teachers or with the students. Um, I think that is really helpful and a really big thing to do in order to bridge the gap between community and school um, for our students. Well, this has been an amazing discussion. Um, really, really wonderful. And I want to thank um, all four of our of our panelists for that. Um, we, we'd applaud if we had a full, but we'll just all of that. <laughs> Um, let me, a couple quick announcements, and then uh, we'll call Sister Helen back. Um, just to let you know some upcoming uh, events after, beyond today's presentation. Again, go to, I'll give you a website, www.csjsl.org. Just to touch on it, June 3rd, there will be an original production, DWB, Driving While Black. It's an opera by CSJ associate Roberta Gumbel. June 8th, a Joe talk on the racial wealth gap in the United States. October 14th, the wine event uh, in which we'll celebrate 155 years of our sisters in coming to Kansas City. And on October 23rd, another linger over breakfast event, care for creation in action with Jerusalem Farm. And again, go to the website, the csjsl.org website to find out information as we go forward. And I wanna thank all of you for, for joining us and we'll call Sister Helen Flemington back to uh, share a prayer. I have uh, experienced many years with uh, Catholic, Black, and I'm very blessed with that. And I know what is going to be happening now, so I'm going to uh, close this with um, a song of Josh Groban, and it's kind of what we've been talking about, and I'm not giving the whole thing, but for this wonderful day and our prayer that we will do. So for today, we pray for what we know can be, and every day we hope for what we still can't see. It's up to us to be the change, and even though we all can still do more, there's so much to be thankful for. Even with our differences, there is a place we're all connected each of us can find each other's light. So for today, we pray for what we know can be. And on this day, we hope for what we still can't see. It's up to us to be the change. And even though this world needs so much more, there's so much to be thankful for. we are <laughs> just wanted to thank all of you again and our panel and um we would like to the few people that are here uh, i've been asked to say will you please linger we want to get some photographs and 
I think that's it, Sister Helen. Thank you for sending us off. And thanks to all of you, both virtually and here.